So our subject in this hour is Cotton Mather. I, I don't know what image his name evokes in your mind, but the typical American has a totally false impression of who he was and what he was like. I think the most common view of Mather is that he was uh, this stern, imposing, judgmental, perpetually frowning, legalistic magistrate in a robe with a furrowed brow casting a long, dark shadow. That's how we think of him. His name even evokes sort of negative imagery. I googled Cotton Mather while I was preparing this, getting my notes together, and I was surprised to learn that Cotton Mather is a character in the Marvel Universe of comic book villains. <laughs> they draw him with this black pilgrim costume with a superhero style cape and they give him this long, straight, scraggly white hair, which was not Cotton Mather at all. Uh, and a face that is not only always angry, in their version, he's always baring his teeth, always. And the popular lore about him has turned him into a hateful caricature. History has been extraordinarily cruel to Cotton Mather, making him out to be this sort of one-dimensional, overbearing, opinionated, medieval mind with a mean-spirited attitude. The truth is Cotton Mather was never as cruel as he's been made out to be. Uh, there was a historian named Worthington Ford. That's not the car dealer Cal Worthington. <laughs> but this was the guy's legitimate name, Worthington Chauncey Ford, who was a historian and a book editor who specialized in early American history. And in 1911, he wrote the preface to the first printed edition of Cotton Mather's diary, and in it he said this. He said, in Mather will be found much to repel and little to attract. In the course of time, his earnestness becomes painful. His resignation and self-abasement ring hollow. His cries become strident. His postures and prayers seem mechanical. And Worthington further said of uh, Mather that he took his religious observations as men take opium. Now, there were indeed some aspects of Cotton Mather's life and opinions that we might not admire. He had a tendency to be a bit of a self-promoter. He sometimes came across as pompous and verbose. He, he might have been a little too fond of getting recognition, and he also might have been a little too concerned about what people thought of him. It's clear that he struggled with a sin of pride, but who doesn't struggle with that? He kept a diary. It's an intensely personal and, and sometimes uncomfortably candid look into his heart. You can't miss the fact that pride and a love of praise and recognition, these were his besetting sins. It comes through even in his diary. And in spite of everything I like about him, it's obvious that he fought a lifelong battle with the sins of Phariseeism, and he didn't always win. Still, I know that it's a battle he constantly waged because sometimes what you read in his diary is so self-abasing. It's such rigorous uh, self-examination and unvarnished honesty that you, you almost wish you could go back in time and give him some words of encouragement. And in fact, his diary is one of the reasons we know so much about Cotton Mather's faults. Uh, but if you read the diary with a modicum of understanding about the times and the circumstances in which he lived, especially if you have any degree of sympathy with his theology and the faith that shaped his thinking, I think you'll admire his discipline, his willingness to examine himself critically, his desire to please God. Uh, there, were a, there were a lot of things to like about him, and it's fair to note that some of the critics take a harsher view of his diary even than I do. One such critic writing from a modern rationalist's perspective in 1927 said this, quote, the diary of Cotton Mather is a treasure trove to the abnormal psychologist. He said the thing would be inconceivable if the record were not in print. What a crooked and diseased mind lay back of those eyes that were forever spying out occasions to magnify self. He said he grovels in self-abasement. His mind is clogged with the strangest miscellany of truth and marvel. 
He labors to acquire the possessions of a scholar, but he listens to old wives' tales with greedy avidity. He was earnest to do good. He labored to put into effect hundreds of good devices, but he always walked in his own shadow. His egoism blots out charity and even the divine mercy. That is a manifestly unfair assessment of Cotton Mather. It grossly overstates his flaws and refuses to acknowledge his virtues and totally misses the, the context of society in which he lived. He was not the only person in his era who absolutely believed old wives' tales, and I'll share some of those with you as we go. Cotton Mather was nothing like the villain popular history has made him out to be. The fact is, he was a beloved pastor. He was gentle in his dealings with people and parishioners. He spent most of his life serving as an assistant pastor to his father, Increase Mather, in Boston's Second Church, it was called, the Second Church. Uh, by the way, that is what the church was called at the time, the Second Church. And the building was sometimes called the Old North Meeting House. And it's not the same as the Old North Church that's made famous by the Paul Revere you know, poem. And you can actually go to the Old North Church in Boston today. Not the same place. This was the Old North Meeting House. Uh, the Old North Church was an Episcopal church. Mather's church was Congregationalist, and it was, at the time, the largest church in all of Massachusetts. And it was a very large church for its time, numbering 1,500 members in the mid-1700s. So although Cotton Mather preached and wrote more uh, prolifically than anyone else, any other pastor in Massachusetts at the time, he was not even the senior pastor of the church he worked for, and he didn't step into that role of senior pastor until his father died in 1723. Cotton himself died just five years later. So he spent only five years as a senior pastor, and yet, for most of his life, he was the most respected and sought-after pastor in all of New England. Increase Mather, his father, wasn't exactly a people person. So it was Cotton Mather who, who did most of the hands-on personal shepherding of the flock. He did all the visitation, counseling, ministering to young people. He organized groups. He did one-on-one -on -one evangelism. He was the one who was approachable and warm-hearted and gentle in his dealings with people. He was a kind and compassionate minister who was known for giving generously of his time to other people. He truly loved the people in his flock. He understood the value of knowledge, treasured knowledge. He pursued wisdom, and he earnestly sought to do what is right. Didn't always manage to do it, but he sought to. And all of those virtues shine if you just take an unprejudiced look at his life and his own record of his life. Increase Mather was a more imposing personality. This was Cotton's father. Increase was magisterial. He was a scholar. He was an intellectual. He was an administrator. Increase actually served as president of Harvard University for a time while Cotton was a student there. And for the first decade of Cotton's work in the church, he was regarded the way you would expect the son of a great minister to be. He, he might express an opinion, and the, min and the response of the people would be, we'll see what your father says about that. <laughs> but Cotton quickly gained respect, and before the first decade of his public ministry ended, his stature actually superseded that of practically every other pastor in Massachusetts, partly because he wrote so much and he preached so often and it's a simple matter of fact that he was truly a learned man by the standards of that time. In fact, by the standards of our day, he would be considered a learned man. If you could get rid of some of the, the medieval ideas that he, that he brought into his thinking, just what he knew about modern times made him a, a learned man and would make him so today. He, he also had a genetic heritage that more or less guaranteed his fame and his influence in Massachusetts. Cotton Mather's grandfathers were the two most important Puritan pastors in the founding generation of Massachusetts. Both of them, both of his grandfathers, came to the New World with the 
very earliest waves of pilgrims, neither of them was on the Mayflower, but they came within a decade after that. Richard Mather, who was Cotton's paternal grandfather, came to the New World in 1635, 28 years before Cotton Mather was born. His maternal grandfather, John Cotton, had come to New England two years before that. John Cotton fled England because his life was in jeopardy. He had come into the crosshairs of Archbishop William Laud. He was, the, at the time, the Bishop of London, a devoted Arminian and a high church Anglican who ultimately became the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he despised the Puritan movement. William Laud, there's quite a bit of evidence in Laud's diary that he was a secret homosexual, never married, and his diaries include records of homoerotic dreams that, and other clues that he was struggling with a powerful same-sex attraction. He was not really a pious man. And as I said, he hated Puritans and put many of them to death. And in fact, if you've ever read anything about the early Puritans, you already know Laud by reputation. One historian said of him, quote, Laud was a humorless, dwarf-like figure who was never much liked even by his allies. But Laud, as I said, rose to the top office of the Anglican Church in the same year that John Cotton arrived in the New World. And Laud was a merciless persecutor of the Puritans. Before he became Archbishop of Canterbury, while he was still Bishop of London, he had summoned John Cotton to the High Court to answer for his nonconformity. And it's a long story that we really don't have time to cover, but John Cotton knew that he would pay with his life for what he believed if he stayed in England, and that's what motivated him to start over in America. He was 47 years old, which by those standards, he was an elderly man already when he immigrated to the New World. The fact that John Cotton was singled out by Bishop Laud is a clue about his prominence. John Cotton was an expert in Greek, Hebrew, Latin, and several other languages. He had studied under Richard Sibbs, and he knew Sibbs well. Another mentor and personal friend of his was William Perkins. Perkins was the first of the great English Puritan theologians. If you know anything at all about Puritan history, you will recognize those names. Both of these men knew and admired John Cotton. And I also have to mention John Owen, probably the best known and most meticulous, most enduring, most influential of all of the classic Puritan theologians. In 1644, more than a decade after John Cotton's arrival in New England, Cotton wrote a book on church polity defending Congregationalism. The book was titled The Keys of the Kingdom of Heaven, and it was a defense of Congregationalism against Presbyterianism and Episcopalianism. And that book reached England, and John Owen acquired a copy because he wanted to refute it. And instead, when he read John Cotton's work, John Owen was converted to Congregationalism. So all of that is to say John Cotton was a supremely eminent theologian and pastor, and he was renowned for the quality of his preaching as well. The Puritan era, you know, was in my judgment, the best chapter in all of church history, and John Cotton was one of the very best men of that era. Two years ago, a friend of mine, Nate Pickowitz, who pastors a church in New England today, edited and republished a biography, a classic biography titled John Cotton, Patriarch of New England, and he asked me to write the foreword for it. So here's my opening line from that foreword. Among the luminaries of the early Puritan era, none shines brighter than John Cotton. He possessed a remarkable array of spiritual gifts and academic accomplishments. He was a brilliant scholar, a master of the biblical languages, a skilled and perceptive theologian, a proficient writer, a powerful preacher, a tender-hearted pastor, a wise and sympathetic counselor, and an effective evangelist. And he was all of those things. Let me add also that John Cotton was the first church leader who was truly and deservedly famous on both sides of the Atlantic. He was a genuinely remarkable man and a top-notch scholar, and he, more than anyone else, was uh, the living embodiment of everything his grandson wanted to be. But Cotton Mather 
had yet another famous and influential Puritan grandfather, Richard Mather. John Cotton and Richard Mather were like-minded Puritan ministers. Neither of them had natural separatist tendencies. Neither of them was seeking to get kicked out of the Anglican Church, but both of them were more or less forced to become separatists when they faced persecution because they didn't follow the high church Anglican traditions. In 1634, Richard Mather was ousted from his Anglican pulpit in Liverpool because the Bishop of York heard that he wasn't wearing a surplice. That's the liturgical vestment. It's one of those knee-length robes that Anglican priests are supposed to wear. Puritans typically refused to wear priestly vestments, and the high church Anglicans loved to wear anything that smacked of ceremonialism. And the Bishop of York was militantly opposed to any hint of nonconformity. And when others pleaded with him for Richard Mather to be reinstated to the pulpit, this bishop famously said, and these are his exact words, it would have been better for him if he had begotten seven bastards because he didn't wear the priestly garment. When John Cotton heard of Richard Mather's dilemma, he wrote to him and urged him to join the colony in Massachusetts. And so Richard Mather and his family set sail in May of 1635. They almost didn't make it. Just before they reached the coast of North America, they were hit with a storm that superseded any, anything anyone ever thought was possible in New England. It was actually a tropical hurricane that had come north, a hurricane known as the Great Colonial Hurricane of 1635. It followed the American coast north, and it hit the Mathers and their ship while they were still on board the ship, just off the coast at the place where Portsmouth, New Hampshire is today. It's, it's right on the border of New Hampshire and Maine. And the ship was seriously damaged, but they managed to limp into Boston Harbor a few days later, and not one life was lost in that storm. Richard Mather accepted a call then to be minister of a new church at Dorchester. That's a neighborhood now about five miles south of downtown Boston. Uh, at the time, five miles was a bit of a distance. So they started a new church there, and he remained pastor of that church until his death in 1869, which means he pastored that church that he founded in the Boston area, what's now the Boston area, for 34 years. Richard Mather was widowed twice. And here's a weird thing. His third marriage was to the widow of John Cotton. John Cotton had died in 1652, and his widow accepted a proposal from Richard Mather about four years after her husband died that marriage lasted 13 years until Richard Mather died in 1669. And it makes a complicated family tree because it means that Cotton Mather's, Cotton Mather's maternal grandmother was also his paternal step-grandmother, <laughs> and she was his father's stepmother. It's weird. Cotton Mather's father increased Mather was the third in, a, in this line of deservedly famous New England pastors. Increase was the first of the Mather line to be born in America. He was born at Dorchester, where his father had planted this church, four years after Richard Mather arrived in the New World. Increase graduated from Harvard at age 17. Harvard College was already more than 20 years old when Increase went there. It shows you how old Harvard was. Harvard is actually the oldest university in America. And after Increase graduated, he went to Ireland where he earned a master's degree. And during that time in Ireland, he also served as a minister in two Puritan churches there in Ireland, in, near Dublin, for the next four years. That was the era of Oliver Cromwell. And Cromwell was trying, by military means, to make Ireland a Protestant country. That's not a good evangelistic strategy, by the way. But Cromwell died very suddenly in the fall of 1858, probably from blood poisoning following a urinary infection. He just died, and there was no leader strong enough to step into Cromwell's shoes. 
So by 1660, the royalists had restored the British monarchy. The king was back. And Increase Mather returned that year to Massachusetts. Now, to be clear, Increase Mather was in Ireland to further his education and to do pastoral work. He wasn't there to be involved with politics or the military campaign of Cromwell and the protectorate. But his position became less tenable once Cromwell's party was out of power. And so he returned to the New World, where he married Maria Cotton. His father, by then, was married to her mother. So Maria was technically his stepsister. But they had grown to adulthood in different households, so it wasn't as weird as it might sound. And in a tightly knit and sparsely populated community like colonial Boston, almost everybody was related to one another anyway. So unions like that weren't particularly unusual. And so Increase and Maria were married in 1662. That was the year after he returned from Ireland. And their first child was Cotton Mather who was born the following year, 1663. Cotton was the first prominent pastor in the New World who spent his entire life in New England. As far as I know, he never went out of Massachusetts. I don't think he ever traveled anywhere. He certainly never traveled abroad. But his life straddled two conflicting eras. Old world customs and medieval ways of thinking were beginning to fade and the Age of Enlightenment was about to dawn, and Mather had one foot planted firmly in each era. And that's how he could, he could let medieval superstitions get out of control during the witchcraft crisis. We'll talk about that. And yet, at the same time, he's so aware of and so interested in all the scientific discoveries that were changing the world all around him. And in fact, his curiosity about scientific progress was really remarkable when you realize that in those days, there was no speedy or easy means of communications between the American colonies and the intellectual centers of Europe and Great Britain. And yet, Cotton Mather found a way to keep up. He devoured journals from the Royal Society and did his own research and experimentation. He collected and cataloged geographical information and botanical specimens and zoological notes and other oddities from the New World, and he would send them back to the Royal Society in England. George Lyman Kittredge, who was an early 20th century Harvard professor, said this. He said, Cotton Mather was one of the best informed Americans of his time in scientific matters. And Mather's letters to the Royal Society of London resulted in his being nominated as a member. Now, the Royal Society was, uh, and still is, the most important academy of science in the English-speaking world. It is to science what the National Geographic Society is to geography and culture. And Mather was one of its earliest mem members from the American colonies. In fact, the only other famous early American that I can think of who was nominated to join the Royal Academy was uh, Benjamin Franklin. We'll talk about him later as well. But Mather wrote a textbook on medicine. I have a copy. He gave all of his books sort of pretentious titles, often with biblical terms or allusions to biblical issues. And so his medical textbook is titled The Angel of Bethesda, subtitled Visiting the Invalids of a Miserable World. <laughs> the book was published, part of it, part of his manuscript was published in 1722. And here's an example of the battle within Cotton Mather between his humility and his pride. He didn't even list his name as the author anywhere on this book. On the title page, the author was given simply as a fellow of the Royal Society. And there was only one person in Massachusetts who would describe himself that way, and the writing style is distinctively Cotton Mather's. You see it in his use of Latin, his strange habit of blending preachy admonitions with his scientific obs observations. And in fact, his Christian worldview bleeds through every single page of this. He mingles spiritual counsel with his medical advice. He constantly recommends fasting and prayer and other spiritual disciplines, not merely for people struggling with emotional and spiritual issues, but also for physical ailments as well. 
He finds spiritual lessons where no one else would even think to look for them. For example, he mentions the problem of bad breath, halitosis, and he says this, Let thy odious breath cause thee to think in speaking, how much has my throat been like an open sepulcher? <laughs> I didn't actually put this in my notes, but he also wrote a devotional for people to use in the outhouse. Uh, and, and actually, it's a little too graphic for me to tell you what that said. But I love this book, The Medical Journal. Anyone who reads it today will be absolutely appalled at the folk remedies that Mather passes off as legitimate medicine. My favorite chapter is chapter 54, which is, has this title. Great things done by small means with some remarks on a spring of medicinal waters, which everybody at home is an owner of. And it's a chapter on the medicinal uses of various kinds of excrement. And in the closing section, those remarks on a spring of medicinal waters, which everybody is at home is the owner of, that's all about the curative powers of human urine. Yeah, it grosses me out too, but I have to, I have to share it with you. <laughs> the chapter opens with this recipe. This is the very start of that chapter. His recipe says this, take fresh cow dung that is gathered in the morning 12 pounds, that's a lot of cow dung. <laughs> Spring water, 30 pounds, mix them and let them stand for digestion 24 hours and then decant the brown tincture. And then he gives that as a remedy. I, I suppose you're supposed to drink it. He doesn't actually say, <laughs> but he gives it as a remedy for gout, kidney stones, and other diseases of the nerves. And then he tells this long story about a woman who used that as a cure-all for every kind of disease, he says, with remarkable success, and he ends the account with these words, quote, "'Tis true, the medicine is but a mean thing, but it is not to be despised." <laughs> and I can't help despising it, but it's funny. <laughs> and I won't go into any detail about the medicinal uses of that spring of medicinal waters which everybody is an owner of, except to say that he says you can gargle with urine and it will cure a sore throat. He also says it's very effective if you use it for cleaning your teeth. I dare you. <laughs> and all of his other uses of, uh, of the spring of medicinal water is too cringeworthy to describe, except for one more. He, <laughs> he says that Fresh morning urine makes a good eye wash for red or watery eyes. Here's one more sample on, uh, on a different subject, though. This, this shows how dentistry has advanced since colonial times. In a section on toothaches, Cotton Mather says this, quote, thrust the eye of a needle into the bowels of a sow bug. That's a kind of crustacean bug. It's a, a wood louse, a sow bug. That's what it looks like. Uh, so thrust a needle into the bowels of that, and the matter which it fetches out, put in the hollow tooth, if it be one that aches. He says, this I have heard cried up as an infallible cure for the toothache, and I've seen some success of it. And then he goes on, another remedy for toothache. A thigh bone of a toad applied to an aching tooth rarely fails of easing the pain. I don't know where you'd get the thigh bone of a toad, but even more mysterious for me is, how would you apply that to a toothache? What, do you grind it into powder? What do you do? I don't know. But he has many more cures for toothaches, and one of them is to take a piece of lint, he says, and soak it with the oil of cloves and put that in the tooth cavity. That's actually a remedy that dentists still recommend, except that they tell you to use a wad of cotton rather than lint. Anyway, this book is fascinating and sometimes chill-inducing to read, and sometimes people cite this book as evidence that, as proof that Mather was either insanely superstitious or just incredibly stupid. But in reality, what he is recording here are fairly common cures in those times. This is how medicine was done.
all of medicine was basically folk medicine, and these were not fanciful remedies that Mather just made up. This was an important book in its time, and as a matter of fact, this was the only comprehensive medical manual from the entire era of colonial America for more than 100 years. And if you read it, what you'll see is Mather's thoroughness is remarkable. Most of his published works were fairly brief and quickly written, but this one took him 14 years to write, and in its modern printing, with very large pages full of type, it runs to more than 300 pages, so it's a massive work. And what it actually shows is just how well read Cotton Mather was, and what an encyclopedic mind he had. He had devoured all the medical journals of his time, and he gleaned and recorded facts about medical practices from ancient Greek and Latin sources. So this is really a remarkable accomplishment. Medical practices were changing, thankfully, as the world moved out of the 17th century, and, but Mather was following those changes. The, uh, the editor of this edition that I have of this book, it's the most recent, it's actually, the, I think, the first complete printing of Mather's medical textbook. The editor was himself a doctor named Gordon W. Jones, and in his introduction, he says this, quote, Mather was far ahead of the body of medical science in thinking that diseases might be separate ills, that they might be caused by the living animalcula, which he saw in his microscope. No one else in America commented on that possibility in print until nearly a century later. And Mather, we will talk about this at length before the hour ends, Mather was hugely responsible for introducing vaccinations to America. That's something I'll come back to, but I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I just want you to understand the unique position into which Cotton Mather was born. His life straddled the 17th and 18th centuries, and so the era of superstition and fears about witchcraft was just beginning to give way to the Age of Enlightenment and significant medical advances and scientific advances uh, and a new appreciation for science. And Cotton Mather is a symbol and a spokesperson for both of those eras. So he sometimes seems self-contradictory, but you just have to understand the times in which he lived. Now, here's a quick overview of some salient features about his life. When Cotton Mather was born in Boston in 1663, colonial Massachusetts was already 40 years old and it was already home to more than 20,000 people. 3,000 people lived just within the small, at the time, small city limits of Boston. And the house where the Mathers lived, most likely the place where he was born, actually stood on the same site in the north end of Boston where Paul Revere's house is preserved today, just a few blocks from the Copps Hill burying ground where Cotton Mather and several of his ancestors and offspring are buried. And we don't know a lot about Cotton Mather's childhood, except that he was taught from a very young age by his father, Increase. Increase had a huge library. This is an actual picture of the books he owned, uh, a, a large library for a colonial pastor. And Cotton also had access to both of his grandfather's books, and he read voraciously, and he mastered several languages before he even entered his teen years. And so Cotton Mather enrolled at Harvard when he was only 11 years old, about to turn 12. He was the youngest student ever to gain admission there, and that record may stand even today, I'm not sure. 11 years old, he seemed destined to follow his father's and his two grandfather's footsteps. He had, a keen, he had keen spiritual interests and the desire to be a pastor, and, and all of that was perfectly set up for him except for one thing. His speech was hampered by a persistent stutter. And he wrote much about his stuttering problem. He even, he even includes an entire chapter on stammering speech in the Angel of Bethesda, his medical book. Most of the chapters of that book, by the way, have Latin titles, Latin or Latin words in the title. That chapter on stuttering, it's chapter 51, it's titled Ephatha, and subtitled, Some Advice to Stammerers. 
Ephatha is an Aramaic word that's found in Mark 7.34, which is where, you know, Jesus heals a deaf mute. And Scripture says he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, he touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And the text says his ears were open and his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Mather then uses that Syriac word as the title for the whole chapter on stuttering. And in that chapter, he describes his own experience in a third-person account. He often wrote about himself in the third person. It's like the Apostle Paul does in 2 Corinthians 12, you know, where Paul says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven. And, of course, Paul there is talking about himself. And Cotton Mather liked to write like that. He described himself in the third person. I, I suspect he did it partly because it made him feel more free to praise himself. But in this case, he's just describing his experience, and he's hoping to help other people who stuttered. He, he write, writes this, I know one who had been very much a stammerer, and no words can tell how much his infirmity did encumber and embitter the first years of his pilgrimage. One day there came an aged schoolmaster to visit him at his chamber in the college where he then resided and addressed him with a discourse to this effect. Did you ever know anyone stammer in singing the Psalms? And he said that you need to start using a very deliberate way of speaking, a drawling that will be just short of singing. And that bit of counsel changed Cotton Mather's life. It cured his stutter, not instantly, but over a few years. And it made, him, it made it possible for him to fulfill his and his parents and his grandparents' ambitions for him to be a pastor. The proud side of his personality can't help but showing up as he describes what happened. He can't, he can't keep himself from boasting. He says this, this advice was followed. The young man soon became a preacher in great congregations, which was a thing as much despaired of as anything in the world. He continued more than 40 years in the service of the churches, wherein his delivery was generally accounted far from any ill circumstance of his ministry, and he was employed in making speeches on the most public occasions, whereof some have been published to the whole world. He says the key to it was deliberation. You see it at the end of this quote if you can read it. It's kind of small type. I say it again, deliberation. He says, that was the thing that heaven gave this happy success unto. In other words, the guy told him, if you speak the way you sing, sort of slowly and deliberately and pronounce each syllable carefully, you won't be falling over yourself with the stutter. And Cotton Mather taught himself to do that, and it made him an able and capable preacher. Partly because he was so young, and partly because of his stuttering, and partly because he felt it was his duty to admonish other students about their behavior, Mather was teased and bullied so badly that before he finished his first semester, his father took him back out of the college and had him complete that first semester at home. Remember, he's an 11-year-old kid, and the older kids apparently picked on him. And in fact, some of his biographers have made much of the trouble Cotton had in his first semester at Harvard, they use it unfairly to paint the 11-year-old Cotton Mather as a sanctimonious sort of a hall monitor type who, you know, narked on other students. One of the 20th century's top New England historians was a man named Samuel Eliot Morrison, who referred to Cotton Mather this way. He called him that insufferable young prig, Cotton Mather. And Morrison opined that if Cotton Mather was being kicked about by older students, the abuse was richly deserved, he said. But don't jump to those conclusions. Cotton was not a tattletale or a troublemaker. And in fact, every record we have suggests that he was actually doing what he's supposed to do when he sees a fellow Christian in sin. He would go and confront the person directly. And the fact is that Cotton Mather... When he returned to Harvard, he did quickly adjust to life, even as the youngest student on campus, and for the rest of his life, he retained warm friendships with men who had been his classmates. There's a really good journal article from the New England Quarterly written by David Levin, who was also a top-notch scholar on American Puritanism. 
in which he discusses how some of Mather's biographers have blown these tales of his social dysfunctionality all out of proportion by using what little we know of his student history. The article is titled, The Hazing of Cotton Mather. Cotton graduated from Harvard with honors as a 15-year-old. He had not, when he graduated, not yet conquered the stuttering problem, and therefore it was still uncertain whether he was going to be able to enter full-time pastoral ministry. And so for the next two years, he began to study medicine. But with the help of prayer and a sustained effort to speak more slowly, more deliberately, he ultimately did conquer his speech impediment. And two years after Harvard, on August 22, 1680, he preached his first sermon. He preached it in Dorchester in the church Richard Mather had founded. Shortly after that, the congregation of Boston's second church unanimously called him to be his father's assistant in the Old North Meeting Hall, and he served there for the rest of his life. Forty-eight years he served in that one church, and as I mentioned, he was his father's assistant for 43 of those years, and then he served as senior pastor just for the last five years of his life. During the first half decade of his ministry, Cotton earned a master's degree at Harvard. In 1681, he started keeping a diary, which he continued not slavishly, but with a fair amount of regularity for the rest of his life. What prompted him to begin the diary, it seems, was that he, he finally settled the issue of assurance of his salvation. And that's what he records in the opening entry of his diary. It's what he focuses on. And also in that first entry, he records a series of resolutions. Uh, very much like Jonathan Edwards' resolutions. Not as good as Jonathan Edwards' resolutions, but resolutions. And then he follows that with a prayer about his tendency to stutter, so that even though he had begun preaching a year before he started the diary, he was evidently still struggling to speak smoothly. But in 1685, the church ordained him, and in March of 1686, the first of all his published works was printed. It was a sermon he had preached at the public hanging of a convicted murderer named James Morgan. It was a, an evangelistic sermon, 54 pages in print, called The Call of the Gospel. Copies were sent to London for sale there, and within a year, a second edition was released. The new edition included an appendix which Mather described as a copy of my discourse with the poor malefactor walking to his execution. So somehow they had the, the little speech that he gave to this guy as he's walking to the gallows about to be hung. This was the first of several hundred things Mather would publish in the years to come. And in fact, at one point, he, he resolved to write a book every month. And judging from the canonical bibliography of his works, he must have come very close to fulfilling that ambition. Uh, in fact, in the words of even some of his enemies, they said he had an itch for writing, an innate itch for writing. He published more words than just about any other historical church leader I can think of, aside from Spurgeon. But two months after publishing that execution sermon, on a Tuesday in May of that year, at age 23, Mather married for the first time. His wife was a girl named Abigail Phillips. She was the 16-year-old daughter of... So he was 23, she's 16. He's, we would say he's robbing the cradle. But again, I think that was common in those days. Her father was a prominent landowner and uh, justice of the peace. Abigail, 16 years old when she married him, she bore nine children, but she lived only 16 more years. And then she suffered some kind of lingering illness after a miscarriage with her final pregnancy. And for seven months, she lingered in illness before she died at the young age of 32. This was, of course, a major grief for Cotton. But early death was a common occurrence in colonial Massachusetts. He would be married again and widowed again, and then married for a third time before he died. Over the course of his life, he fathered 15 children, but only six of them lived to adulthood, and only two of those were still living when Mather himself died. One son was a prodigal who left home and then was lost in a shipwreck. 
very, very sad part of his life. Uh, three of Cotton's sisters became widows, and they relied on him for support. So he was well acquainted with sorrows. But the one tragic episode for which he is most remembered was the witchcraft episode in Salem Village. The first rumblings of trouble over witchcraft actually came in 1688. Uh, that's four years before the witchcraft episode that we all know about. But 1688, things in New England were politically volatile. The King of England, Charles II, had revoked the Charter of Massachusetts in 1684. And in 1688, the colony sent Increase Mather to petition the king to restore the charter. So Increase went back to England. And as it turned out, all he could do would be to negotiate a new charter, which he did. But he was gone from New England for nearly four years. And it was during those years that Increase was gone that the witchcraft trouble started. Increase, in fact, had hardly left. He barely left New England when four children in the, in the family of a man named John Goodwin began to manifest signs of demon possession. And Cotton Mather, who's now solely responsible for pastoral care in his father's congregation, uh, he took an interest in this family's case. And he was no stranger to tales of demon possession. One of Increase Mather's most famous and most enduring books is a record of remarkable providences. It has a longer title than that, but that's, it's usually known as Remarkable Providences. I have a copy of it. And, it. and it has several stories about strange cases of preternatural phenomena. And then the book includes a number of stories about New Englanders who suffered fits and possessions that seemed demonic. Stories about witchcraft and things like that. So Cotton Mather, who had helped his father on the writing of that book, had some knowledge of cases like these, demon possession, and he and his wife took the eldest daughter of this afflicted family, a 13-year-old girl named Martha Goodwin, took her into their own home to try to help her, and over a period of several weeks, through biblical admonition and prayer and fasting, Mather was able to help her return to a state of mental and spiritual soundness. He, he recorded later that his prayers for the whole family were answered, and by degrees, he says, all four of the children were fully and quickly delivered. Uh, there was a woman named Anne Glover at the time who was accused of bewitching these children. She was an embittered woman with a reputation for using bad language and, and tinkering with occult practices, and she was also a committed Roman Catholic who despised the Puritan dominance of Boston, and she was tried and convicted and hanged for witchcraft. And that would have been the end of the matter. All of that happened in 1688, the, the year Cotton Mather's father left for England. The following year, 1689, he published a book on the case, which he titled Memorable Providences Relating to Witchcraft and Possession. And that book gave several more short accounts of witchcraft cases and demonic manifestations. But the bulk of the book was a, a detailed account of, of Martha Goodwin's case, the girl that he'd had in his home. And the telling of the symptoms and all of that from her demonic possession sparked both fear and curiosity across New England. People suddenly concerned about the unseen work of the devil. And in fairness to Cotton Mather, despite what some historians assume, he was not trying to whip up hysteria over witchcraft or, or inflame some kind of speculative superstitions. He actually preached a sermon on witchcraft to the congregation, and his point, his central point was, he stressed the fact that the proper remedies to Satan's devices are prayer and fasting and the pursuit of sanctification, not charms and hexes and conjurations. He's trying to quell superstition. But there was much to fear in all the conflicts and political uncertainties in colonial Massachusetts. And these were superstitious times. And so the witchcraft scare in Salem Village exploded about three years later, in 1692. Actually, less than two years after Mather had published his book on the Martha Goodwin case. Here's a quick summary of, of what happened. Some preteen and teenage girls in Salem Village were experimenting with an occult method of 
soothsaying. In, of all places, in the household of the local pastor, Reverend Samuel Paris. These girls were secretly being taught occult ideas by a household servant, an Indian woman from Barbados named Tichuba, and she had showed them how to tell fortunes by putting an egg white in a glass and using that as if it were a crystal ball. And soon these girls started manifesting fits and unseen torments, signs of bewitchment or demon possession. And over the next few months, these girls accused several people in Salem Village of witchcraft. Salem Village, by the way, is a different location than Salem. It's more inland. Uh, Salem Village was a sort of a new outpost that was being settled. It's today Danvers, if you know the Boston area. Danvers is what used to be Salem Village. People often think Salem witchcraft, but it was actually Salem Village. And these girls began to accuse people in, in that community of witchcraft. So a special court was convened to put these accusations on trial. And in the end, 20 people were convicted of witchcraft. 19 people were hanged. And one man, a guy named Giles Corey, was pressed to death, meaning he was slowly crushed under a heavy weight. I mean, they, they, they would make him lie down under a wooden frame like a door and pile rocks on it until he died. And no one, by the way, was burnt at the stake. That's a myth. It's also a myth that only women were accused and executed. Not true. But 20 people were executed based almost entirely on the testimony of these girls. The girls testified that they could see into the invisible world and they claimed to see the accused doing things that no one else could see. And the court permitted that kind of testimony. They called it spectral evidence. Spectral evidence is defined as testimony by a witness who would claim that the defendant's spirit or a ghost in the shape of that person had appeared to the, the witness, the victim, in a dream or a vision when the accused person's physical body was actually at a different location. And the bewitched girls told lots of tales like that. Right in court, they would say, they can see this person doing things. From the start, Cotton Mather tried to warn officials against the use of spectral evidence. He didn't trust it. But he was, he was still a young man in his 20s, his late 20s. He didn't have the clout to tell the legal authorities, the judges, what evidence they should consider. Cotton Mather's role in this whole episode has always been overstated and embellished. He was not a witch hunter. He didn't testify in the trials. He wasn't encouraging these girls to accuse people. He and most of the other ministers in Massachusetts believed that the court was rushing to judgment. But critics today say, nevertheless, he didn't do enough to stop the proceedings. And there may be some truth in that. Increase Mather returned from England on May 14th of uh, 1692. This was about four and a half months into the witchcraft hysteria. On June 2nd, two weeks after Increase Mather returned, the first trial of an accused witch began. The defendant was Bridget Bishop. She was found guilty and executed in speedy fashion on June 10th, 10 days after her trial started. She's executed. Four days later, five days later, on June 15th, Cotton Mather released a letter written to the governor and the court in response to the court's request for pastoral advice. The court, the judges are saying, give us counsel here. And the letter Cotton Mather wrote is titled, The Return of Several Ministers Consulted by His Excellency and the Honorable Counsel Upon the Present Witchcraft in Salem Village. And it's dated Boston, June 15, 1692. So it was written by Cotton, but it was signed by 12 New England ministers, notable among them Increase Mather. And the ministers pleaded for restraint and caution. They said the trials should be conducted with, these are their words, with an exceeding tenderness towards those that may be complained of, the accused, especially if they've been persons formerly of an unblemished reputation. And they warned that spectral evidence is an undoubted and a notorious thing, but a demon may, by God's permission, appear even to ill purposes in the shape of an innocent, yea, and a virtuous man. So they're warning against the reliability of spectral evidence. 
But the trials went on and more people were accused and debates about the legitimacy of spectral evidence continued and, and grew stronger and stronger until October 3rd when Increase Mather issued a document that definitively condemned the use of spectral evidence to condemn witches. The title of Increase Mather's published work is Cases of Conscience Concerning Evil Spirits, Personating Men, Witchcrafts, Infallible Proofs of Guilt in Such as Are Accused with That Crime, All Considered According to the Scriptures, History, Experience, and the Judgment of Many Learned Men. One writer, uh, Chadwick Hansen, who's written a book on the Salem issue, he says this, Everyone who heard that title knew immediately that Increase Mather was issuing a flat and direct challenge to the court's opinions on spectral evidence. And that is what finally put a stop to the witchcraft episodes. It was actually Increase and Cotton working together to, to convince people that the spectral evidence should not be used. Within a few days after the publication of Increase Mather's Cases of Conscience, the governor ordered the proceedings closed, and that was the end of the witchcraft scare. Samuel Sewell, who was one of the magistrates who had participated in the proceedings, was himself a devout believer. Uh, he was a bitter opponent of slavery. He was an advocate for women's rights in, in those days, not the same as it sounds today, but he was the strictest of Puritans when it came to doctrine and holiness. Uh, but he was perhaps the best known person on this panel of judges who had condemned the witches. And what Sewell is most remembered for today is his public repentance for the role he played in the witchcraft fiasco. He, he believed that the witchcraft hysteria was the reason that several bitter strokes of divine providence befell his family in the five years following the witchcraft affair. Two daughters and his mother-in-law died, another child was stillborn, and in the wake of this flood of sorrows, he read Matthew chapter 12, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. And that verse struck him to the heart. He wrote out a sorrowful public expression of repentance and lament. He had it read to the entire church, and he called for a fast day so that the whole community could collectively express their grief over the guilt of what they had done. And in fact, there's a mural today in the Massachusetts State House commemorating his contrition. By the way, Samuel Sewell is another New Englander whose diaries were preserved and published in two volumes. And if you're interested in New England history, you have to read Samuel Sewell's diary. It's very interesting, but I can't get off on that now. So we have to ask, how did Cotton Mather become the chief villain in historians' retelling of the witchcraft episode? How did his name and his reputation get so tarnished? And the answer is this, about eight years after the witchcraft trials ended, a man named Robert Califf wrote a scandalous account of the events in Salem Village, purposely designed to uh, uh, belittle Cotton Mather and accuse him. Califf was the first to exaggerate Mather's role in the whole episode, and he filled this book with insinuations calling Mather's character into question, even his moral character. And that book hurt Mather in a way that he never fully recovered from. Samuel Eliot Morrison, I quoted him earlier, he's the same 20th century historian who referred to Mather as an insufferable prig. He wrote this about Robert Califf. He said, Califf, who had it in for Cotton Mather, tied a tin can to him after the frenzy was over, and it has rattled and banged through the pages of superficial and popular historians. I could talk for days about the witchcraft delirium and how it ultimately ruined American Puritanism, but we don't have that kind of time. I have actually two overstuffed shelves of books in my office on that one subject alone, but the one book that I most strongly recommend if you want to read an even-handed, objective, and readable record of the history is, is called Witchcraft at Salem by Chadwick Hansen. I quoted him a minute ago. Chadwick Hansen. I'll give you the, that recommendation along with two other books at the end. But we have to move on. I want to mention that Cotton Mather 
was largely responsible for introducing the practice of vaccination to America. He describes the practice in an appendix to his chapter on smallpox in the Angel of Bethesda, his manual of medical practices. Mather had actually learned about inoculation from an African domestic servant whose name he says was Onesimus. Mather describes Onesimus as a pretty intelligent fellow. He respected him. And Onesimus had explained to Cotton Mather that his people had learned how to take a little fluid from a smallpox lesion and bind it with some substance and put a drop of that into a small cutting on someone's skin. In other words, you give them a taste of the smallpox infection. And in Onesimus's words, he, he told Cotton Mather, nobody die of it and nobody have smallpox anymore. And in his own vast reading of medical and scientific journals, Mather had read about other successful experiments with vaccination, and so he advocated this process as early as 1716. But almost no one paid attention. He's a pastor, not a doctor. Uh, one other medical doctor who fancied himself the, the only real expert on this matter called Mather's proposal a silly story, and he called it a farce. But five years later, a smallpox epidemic hit Boston. And Mather inoculated himself and began inoculating other willing people. In all, he, he and, and a doctor who, who liked his theory, the two of them together inoculated 242 people, and only six of those people subsequently died. Comparing that to the population at large, where one in every seven people who came down with smallpox died. So in all, 844 Bostonians died that year. That was 14% of the total population. It was an epidemic that lasted a full year, more than a year, and, and half of the population was hit by it. Half of the population got the infection, came down with smallpox. But nevertheless, while this epidemic was in full swing, popular opinion was dominated by the anti-vaxxers, and they were passionate. One of them made a bomb, and they threw it in a window at Cotton Mather's house at 3 a.m. on November 14th. This was a, a ball of some kind loaded with a mixture of gunpowder and turpentine. And thankfully, it didn't explode. What happened was it hit part of the windowsill on the way in, and, and then when it landed on the floor, the fuse came out of it. And Mather said the bomb itself was heavy enough that if it had fallen on one of his children, the weight alone would have been enough to cause a fatal injury. So this is a bomb big enough to destroy his whole house. And there was a written message tied to the grenade with a string, and the note said this, Cotton Mather, you dog. Damn you. I'll inoculate you with this, with a pox to you. So this was an anti-vaxxer who was pretty angry. Anyway, the criticism and abuse that Mather got from the anti-vaxxers was the most widespread, mean-spirited, and sustained opposition he ever received. It even superseded the vitriol of some of his critics in the wake of the Salem witchcraft. One biographer points out that Mather was, and these are his words, he was well-practiced in receiving comeuppance, but he had never before been so publicly, relentlessly, and ferociously clawed. And so on the last day of 1721, is the end of the epidemic year, as the epidemic is winding down, Mather recorded in his diary that there was, these are his words, a dark and faint cloud striking over my mind. He said, I begin to feel some hazards, lest my troubles, whereof I have a greater share than any minister in the country, grow too hard for me and unfit and unhinge me for my services. So he's literally worried about both his sanity and his ability to carry on his ministry. And about two weeks later, he told a meeting of fellow ministers that he was considering moving away from Boston, never followed through on those plans, because the smallpox epidemic was ending. And when the final figures were tallied, it was clear that those who were inoculated fared literally a thousand times better than those who weren't inoculated. The efficacy of the smallpox inoculation was established, and vaccinations against smallpox, especially the methods by which they were administered, what they used to do is make a cutting of, in your skin and, and drop 
some substance that carried the infection into that. And people would break out with, with pox marks. So it was much more deadly than the kind of smallpox inoculations we get today. But things were getting better in the years to come. Here's an irony about that. The vaccinations didn't get safer soon enough. Just 36 years after this, in 1758, a smallpox vaccination is what killed Jonathan Edwards. Now, I wanted to mention one more fact about Cotton Mather. His life intersected at a few key points with Benjamin Franklin, who was 42 years his junior. In a letter he wrote to Samuel Mather, Cotton Mather's son, Franklin recounted an incident that occurred when, when Benjamin Franklin was just a teenager and Mather was already in his 60s. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was running an errand for his brother who was a publisher and this errand took him to Cotton Mather's study and Franklin recalls it this way. This is what he writes in this letter. He says, I still remember a piece of advice Cotton Mather gave me. He says, I had been some time with him in his study where he condescended to entertain me, a very youth, with some pleasant and instructive conversation. As I was taking my leave, he accompanied me through a narrow passage at which I did not enter and which had a beam across it that was lower than my head. He continued talking, which occasioned me to keep my face partly towards him as I retired. So he's backing down the steps, not looking where he's going when Cotton Mather suddenly cried out, Stoop! Stoop! Not immediately understanding what he meant, Franklin says, I hit my head hard against the beam. <laughs> Cotton Mather then added, Let this be a caution to you, not always to hold your head so high. Stoop, young man, stoop as you go through the world, and you'll miss many hard thumps. <laughs> That's so Cotton Mather, by the way. Like I said, he could find a spiritual application in everything. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin says, this is a way of hammering instruction into one's head. And it was so far effectual that I have ever since remembered it, though I've not always been able to practice it. So that was a letter to Mather's son, Samuel Mather. Benjamin Franklin, I think, is just being polite and somewhat disingenuous there. Benjamin Franklin was not at all an admirer of the Puritans and their faith, and Cotton Mather was someone whom he had always singled out for ridicule. He grew up in Boston, Franklin did, so Mather was always a presence there, and Benjamin Franklin literally made a living making fun of him. In fact, a year before this incident in the stairway, when the teenage Ben Franklin had this encounter in Cotton Mather's study, Franklin had started writing satirical letters to the editor of the New England Current under the pseudonym Silence Do Good. <laughs> Pretending to be a woman, Silence Do Good was a woman's name, he's mocking Puritanism in a writing style that was designed to mimic Cotton Mather. And in fact, Ben Franklin's older brother was the newspaper's editor. That's why he was running errands for him. And he kept rejecting material, his brother did, anything Benjamin wrote and submitted to him, he would reject. And so Ben Franklin submitted a satirical letter to the editor un under a pseudonym. It didn't tell his brother who wrote it. James didn't know Benjamin had written it, and he published it. And so these letters, known as the Silence Do Good letters, there are 14 of them, they are the earliest published works of Benjamin Franklin, and written while he was a teenager, written to lampoon Cotton Mather during the most difficult years of his life, and granted there are parts of them that are funny, but it's pretty mean-spirited stuff. Ben Franklin actually would have been a hit, I think, in today's ideological wars on the internet. He was good at the snark and sarcasm. And Franklin wrote 14 of these silence do-good letters before he stopped. And nobody knew through all of it who was actually writing them. But in all likelihood, silence do-good was at the peak of her popularity when Benjamin Franklin banged his head on the beam in Mather's stairway. So I hope it gave him a really hard thump. <laughs> Cotton Mather died just five years after his encounter with the youthful Ben Franklin. He had been bedridden for about six weeks, 
with what his son described as a hard cough and a suffocating asthma with a fever. He died peacefully on February 13th, 1728. That was one day after his 65th birthday. He had known he was dying for a few weeks, and he prayed to be spared from a hard death. The Lord answered that prayer. The last word Cotton Mather ever spoke was grace. Fitting ending to a great life. I want to recommend three books. Uh, one I've already named, Chadwick Hansen's book, Witchcraft at Salem. If you can find this, you're only going to find, I think, used copies on the Internet. But if you're interested in the witchcraft episode, this is, I believe, probably the most easy to read and best treatment of the whole matter. Very carefully documented. Uh, he is, he's even-handed, he's fair-minded with Cotton Mather, recognizes his flaws as well as his virtues. So I recommend this book. It's very readable. It's not a scholarly book, but as I said, it's very well do documented. Another one, a biography of Cotton Mather. My favorite is by Kenneth Silverman called The Life and Times of Cotton Mather. This book won the Pulitzer Prize in 1985. Uh, I read it around 1991, I think, a few years after it had won the Pulitzer Prize. And it's the thing that sparked my keenest interest, I think, in Cotton Mather and his life. It's very thorough, uh, interestingly well-documented. This guy read every bit of correspondence, all the diaries, everything he could find from first-hand sources about Cotton Mather and wrote what so far I think is the most careful and thorough biography of Mather. And it's also even-handed, fair-minded. Uh, again, he, he recognizes the flaws, but he also highlights the virtues of Cotton Mather. And then the third one, the newest of these three books, is called uh, The First American Evangelical, A Short Life of Cotton Mather by Rick Kennedy. It's an evangelical book. I forget who published it. I should have made a record of that. But this is, just came out in the past couple of years. It's a shorter biography of Mather, but it's also very well done. It calls him the first American evangelical. I, I think I would dispute that, maybe. Maybe not. He gives a good argument for it. He's actually uh, he, he's borrowing the idea for that title from another book about Increase Mather. called It's a biography of Increase Mather called The Last American Puritan. And so he says, if Increase Mather was the last American Puritan, then Cotton Mather was the first evangelical. I can live with that. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have said it like that. I think Mather was always more of a Puritan than an evangelical, but there you have it. So with that, I'll stop. We've got 10 minutes to get to the main service. Hopefully you can get a seat over there. Thank you.